You're watching Reason Live, streaming to you from Los Angeles. The following is a live, unedited conversation between the host, the guest, and the online audience. If you'd like to participate, please leave your question in the YouTube chat. The views expressed by guests and the audience members in this discussion do not necessarily reflect those of Reason. And now your host, Zach Weissmuller. Hey folks, thank you for joining. Uh, this is, you're in here on the ground floor of our experiment, our live stream experiment, and uh, I appreciate it. Um, this is new for me, new for reason. Um, it's just something that uh, I wanted to try uh, because uh, as video journalists, we spend a lot of time uh, talking to people and kind of distilling down the essence of what they have to say. But in those conversations, we really uncover a lot of uh, interesting material and have interesting conversations. And so I just wanted, we just want to share a little bit of that in a looser format. And today and the rest of this week, I'm going to be hosting it. Uh, but we're hopeful that if this experiment works out well, that other Reason staffers will come on and we'll have a sort of rotating uh, host in this seat. Uh, so if you do like what you see here today and the rest of this week, please let us know. Uh, you can tell us uh, in the comments section. You can email us. The, the email we're using for this program is questions at reason.com. Uh, and today, uh, in this very first live stream, we're going to be talking to Josiah Zayner, who uh, runs a company called The Odin that sells do-it-yourself CRISPR kits that allow you to genetically modify organisms from the comfort of your own home. So uh, we're going to uh, get to Josiah in just a minute. Uh, he's a really interesting guy, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Um, and uh, But do know that this is a participant participatory forum. Uh, that's part of what I'm trying to create here is, is a space where uh, people who are interested in these topics uh, can come in and, and ask questions and, and uh, participate in the conversation. So we will be checking the chat. Uh, and yes, uh, you're hearing Josiah's uh, daughter. She's, she's uh, sick, so you might hear some, some baby noises in the background. But, you know, that's, that's the beauty of live video. Uh, we take life as it comes. So um, we uh, will get started with Josiah in just a second. Um, I, one thing I do want to let you know is, uh, I mentioned before, we're going to be doing, uh, one of these every day this week at various times. Uh, and tomorrow we're going to be talking to Lenore Skenazy about how to raise a kid, uh, and give them maximal freedom in, in this world that seems to, uh, point in the other direction. Uh, but if you want to be notified about these videos or uh, many of the other documentaries and interviews that we put up on our channel, please be sure to subscribe and, and press that little uh, notification bell to get the notifications when we uh, go live. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to play a little clip uh, from the first uh, documentary short I did on Josiah and his company. Just I think it's going to give you a sense of uh, the Odin, his company, and Josiah, and, and kind of where he's coming from. And then we will get right into the conversation. So uh, take a look at this. Suffering needlessly because of all these committees and all these rules. And what happens if people just start saying, like, fuck you, I'm going to do it anyway. And what if people start getting cured? Okay, so here we are with Josiah. Um, he is a self-described biohacker. Hello, Josiah. Hey, what's up, Zach? Good to see you again. Let me fit me in the window here. Yeah, look, looking good. Okay, um, <laughs> so we, we made that video uh, back in June of 2016, um, and your company was just kind of getting started at that point. Um, now, uh, a couple years later, could you just tell us uh, what has changed since then? Have you seen growth? Uh, uh, have you seen, have you expanded your product line? Where is uh, the Odin at, at at this point? Oh, yeah, man, that was really cool. I, I remember when you first came there, I look a little, uh, you know, rough because <laughs> I was working all the time in my garage, packing up these kits, trying to get my startup going. Uh, since then, things have been going great. Um, the company is 
you know, kicking butt. We're growing really fast. We're about to move into a, a new space in Oakland. Um, yeah, people are buying these kits. People are interested in genetic engineering and synthetic biology and CRISPR, and I think that's amazing. And could you uh, and could you let us know uh, just for people who are new to this area, what the overview? You know, CRISPR is basically a gene editing mechanism. Uh, could you just give kind of the dummies version of what CRISPR is and why it's important? Yeah, so CRISPR is important. It's this new genetic engineering technology that actually allows people to edit genomes easier than we could ever do before. And what this allows is it allows, uh, you know, greater accessibility for not only researchers, but also people who are trying to do this stuff in their home or, you know, edit some embryos. And uh, a lot of people in the chat are already asking about designer babies, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, uh, given the news out of China, the recent news out of China. I know you have some thoughts on that. But first, I want to get uh, just this overview uh, a little bit. And and one thing uh, I want to ask is just, you know, what are people actually making with these kits that you're selling, you know, out of your garage? Yeah, so a lot of our kits are educational. So, uh, you know, genetic engineering and CRISPR and things like that, it's a lot like programming, right? So it's these kits, what they do is they essentially teach people to program genetically. So they're not necessarily meant to allow people to do, you know, greater and cooler stuff, though you can, but people have to learn to do that stuff. A lot of people right now are really interested in human genetic engineering, um, especially in the biohacker community. There are a lot of people who have been, you know, uh, self-experimenting and trying crazy stuff in that area. And I think that's going to blow up. Uh, the Odin, our company, we actually started selling kits that allow people to learn how to do animal genetic engineering with frogs. And, uh, you know, that's getting really big. So people are starting to move more towards things that can contribute directly to science and medicine right now, which is crazy. It blows my mind. Yes. Yeah, so talk about that aspect of your entire project, because uh, this is really about democratizing science in a way you're trying to, you know, it's a lot of these, this is cutting edge science and a lot of it for decades has been locked up in institutions, uh, university laboratories, government laboratories. You yourself worked for NASA at one point. Um, so give me a little bit of that philosophy that, uh, that is driving you right now. Yeah, I mean, so I think all my philosophy kind of stems from, uh, you know, the computer hacker movement. I grew up in the you know, 90s computer hacker movement. And it was all about making things accessible, all about like people being able to program and create whatever they want to create. Um, and that just led to an explosion in, you know, computer programming, computer tech. And even nowadays, there's so many resources that have just expanded off that, like GitHub and all these places where, you know, Stack Overflow, where people can get access to code, get access to answers on how to do these things. And that's just amazing. And computers were once just in universities. They were once something that nobody could afford. And when people said, well, we should make computers accessible to everybody, people kind of laughed. And they were like, what is somebody going to do with the computer? You know, like, these are for, you know, solving equations to shoot missiles and stuff. But then yep, go people ahead. eventually figured out how to do stuff. And now, you know, we use them so much. And I think the same thing can happen with genetic engineering, right? Like this technology is so powerful. It's probably one of the most powerful technologies we know of, right? And like just keeping it in the hands of a few people, it just doesn't make any sense to me, right? Hmm. It doesn't make any sense at all. Like, how can we get this into the most hands possible so it can help the most people possible? And so you've been working to do that, and you've already gotten it in lots of hands. And uh, someone in the comments section is asking, uh, Turtles with Bombs, has anyone done anything exciting with homemade CRISPR yet? Has anybody done anything exciting with homemade CRISPR? Um, I don't know. Uh, 
from as far as I know, it's still in its infancy. So I don't think anything anybody's done anything too crazy. But uh, you know, people are learning. It's like the early days of people having computers. Um, you know, you can't people. What people are doing is basically the equivalent of writing basic computer programs that do Hello World or whatever, something like that. And it's starting to progress beyond that point, but it all takes time, right? Like you have to understand that like the personal computer from the time that was invented until we had, you know, all the programs and everything we, we could use, it took years. And it's the same thing with this. My company, we just really started, you know, in uh, 2016. So it's a, uh, it, it's been a very short period of time and to see the growth is crazy. People are super interested. I'm excited about what people are going to create. And uh, let me play another clip from one of our other documentaries we made where, uh, you know, you went f uh, from the, you, you start selling kits that made things like glowing beer and this glowing beer, uh, well, it made, it genetically modified yeast to make the yeast glow and then people could make glowing beer. And I'm going to throw up some images of that. And just right now, because like biohackers and people doing science at home is so new, there's really not much regulation at the moment. Mm -hmm. People have a lot of freedom to do. Some people are even getting mad academics and people working in universities because they have institutional guidelines that they have to follow. So the government doesn't impose certain guidelines on research. But the institution, the university, imposes guidelines on those researchers then. Which, if you're working in your garage, your, your institution is basically you and maybe your friends and sure. stuff like that. So there's no regulation. I think that the government probably in the future sometime will try to regulate it. Okay, so have we reached that point yet? Has the government tried to regulate this space or are you still kind of so far ahead of the curve where the regulators are just catching up with you? So I think we're pretty far ahead of the curve, but last year I did a couple experiments to genetically modify myself um, to learn about human genetic engineering and just to see what was possible because you see these gene therapies like Lux Turna being sold for a million dollars to treat people, cure genetic form of blindness. A million dollars. Could you imagine if somebody came up to you and told you like, yeah, we can cure your blindness, but it'll cost you a million dollars, like, and your insurance won't cover it. That would be crazy. So I want to understand like, like how difficult is it actually to do human genetic engineering? Because obviously I'd never done it before. So the only person I had to experiment on was myself. Um, I didn't want to experiment on my brother, even though he's a little crazy. And uh, I was actually successful um, in a couple different techniques. And uh, right after that, not long, maybe like a month or two, the FDA immediately put out a notice that said, like, any use of CRISPR um, is genetic engineering, genetic modification, gene therapy technology, and will immediately be regulated. It was pretty crazy. It's Wait, the fastest so I've ever seen that movie. What did you do to yourself? <laughs> so I did a couple experiments. One was to take the same jellyfish gene from the yeast and put that in my body, right? Um, the other was Wait, to Wait, so you made yourself my... glow? Is that is that what happened? <laughs> yeah. It didn't... It, like I couldn't see it visually with my eyes, but that was the goal. But I was able to detect the, you know, the proteins, the DNA, the RNA inside my cells. Hmm. So the goal would be you'd have to infect a large number of cells. Um, something like that, though, is definitely possible. They do it in, you know, animals all the time. Hmm. So it was just seeing like how to apply it to humans. Like how different is this than what they talk about in papers and academia and, and things like that. And the other was I injected myself with a uh, myostatin knockout CRISPR experiment. Okay, um, and I wanna talk more about that in just a second, but I do have a clip of that moment that I want everyone to uh, enjoy. <laughs> this will modify my muscle gene genes to give me bigger muscles. Didn't actually hurt that much. <laughs> oh! Hurts a lot more going in. 
All right, there we go. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why people don't try it. I'll, I'll let you know how it works out. Okay, so how did it work out? <laughs> oh, man. I, I don't know whenever I see that if I should feel embarrassed or, or <laughs> what. Um, so I did some tests, uh, did biopsy, and there's these tests you can run to uh, check the DNA sequence inside the cells, right, mm -hmm. to see if there are any changes in the DNA bases. This happens when the Cas9 protein cuts the DNA and uh, the DNA comes back together. I uh, saw changes, but I also saw changes in my control sample, which was just uh, my blood, uh, my red blood cells. So it wasn't, it wasn't really conclusive. Um, I didn't inject a lot. If you watch the video, you can see where I talk about like, in order to really get a strong effect, you need to inject uh, a lot more DNA and do multiple injections. So usually when they do gene therapies, uh, what they do is, you know, they'll do like, um, I know for one gene therapy that was a, approved, Glybera, I think they do like 20 injections or something like that. So it would probably need to be significantly more. That that experiment was kind of like a proof of concept, but also trying to be provocative because you can make these gene therapies for hundreds of dollars. And I don't think people understand that, right? When a company comes and says, we're selling this for a million dollars, it doesn't cost a million dollars to manufacture. It costs maybe, you know, a few thousand dollars. That's it. And, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, some of this self-experimentation has gotten, uh, it has worked to be provocative and get a lot of press. And, and you gave some interviews uh, after a gentleman, I believe, injected some sort of uh, herpes, vac homemade herpes vaccine. Uh, in himself at a, at a conference, and and you said you told the Atlantic, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that somebody is going to end up hurt eventually. Uh, do you still feel that way? Are you starting to have second thoughts about where this is all going? Yeah, no. I mean, uh, so when I did these experiments, you know, I did my PhD and all these things, and I you know worked with animals and worked with you know mammalian cell code, all these things before I did these experiments, and you know coding your own DNA and and you know figuring out protocols to how to inject. And I spent a lot of time working on that, um, like a year and a half testing a bunch of different techniques on myself and measuring the DNA and and RNA and things in my cells, I didn't expect things to happen so fast. And even with the genetic modification of these embryos, whether it's true or not, like thing, things are moving way faster than I expected. And that kind of scares me, right? Like, I mean, because I just didn't, when you don't anticipate something, when it's so new, when it's so something outside your comfort zone, it, it scares you a little bit. But I also think there's a lot of excitement in that fear. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, since you brought it up, let, let's get into the, uh, the what seems to have been a CRISPR modified human embryo in China of two twin girls that were actually given birth to. So this is the first, if, if true, this is the, these are the first CRISPR modified uh, human beings. Um, and uh, of course, since it's 2018, the scientist who did it uh, made a YouTube video about it. And here's a clip from his YouTube video. Early gene surgery may be the only viable way to heal an inherited disease and prevent a lifetime suffering. We hope you have the mercy for them. Their parents don't want a desired baby, just a child who won't suffer from a disease which medicine cannot prevent. Gene surgery is and should remain a technology for healing. Enhancing IQ or selecting hair or eye color is not what a loving purple does. That should be banned. I understand my work will be controversial, but I believe family need this technology and i'm willing to take the criticism for them okay so that was uh i'm not sure how to pronounce his name he's uh i apologize for butchering your name but 
um, he, uh, he he's making the case here that what he's done, what he claims to have done is uh, made uh, these young, these baby girls uh, resistant to HIV. Uh, so, and he is framing it as an ethical imperative, uh, especially in China where having AIDS, uh, carries a special stigma with it. Um, so what's your reaction to that? And, uh, as someone who pays close attention to the science here, um, how much do we know about how real this is? Yeah, um, you know, so I'm sure you know, and you saw on Twitter and the news media, everybody freak has freaked out about it. And I guess that's kind of understandable because this is just totally crazy, right? You can imagine the first time ever a human being gets genetically modified and born, and it was outside all mainstream, right? This guy... Uh, Dr. Jean Cou, uh, he he essentially he said he paid for it himself in the talk he gave. Um, who knows if that's true or not, or how much he paid for himself? But he essentially, you know, was a biohacker. He working completely outside the system, right? Not trying to do it in any institution, not trying to do it um, with any company or anything like that. Uh, and it 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 was just crazy, right? I think a lot of people are freaked out because like what everybody expected when, when they did IVF and like one of the first IVF babies was born, you know, they had like documentary crews following these people around and were like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, so awesome. It's such a point in history. And, you know, the media had access to all these people. And this time, just some guy that people, you know, he, he has a PhD and he's studied a uh, you know, science and all this stuff before, but like he's an, a no name technically in academia and in academia, you're not allowed to be a no name and do cool and interesting stuff. Mm. It just, you don't get the funding, right? It doesn't happen, but this so guy he jumped the basically, line. He, he, uh, he, he jumped the line. He jumped to the front of the queue there. Totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like he jumped, because you know what would happen normally in the U.S.? A bunch of scientists would write grants and apply to the FDA and apply to the government and say, we want to do this experiment. And the FDA would choose one of these universities or companies and say, all right, you get to be the first one who does this. And it's so political and it's so full of bullshit, right? And he totally jumped that line. And not only that, he's not Western, right? And that's right. just crazy. And I think that that's blowing people's minds that he's not from the Western world, right? Europe or the U S or any place like that. He's from China. And that, that's people are like, you know, they're scared of that. Yeah. And that's, that's something that we're going, seems like we're going to have to contend with because in a way, China seems like not the wild West, but I guess the wild East, like they are just uh, yeah. a, like, it's not going to be it, it, on some level. It was not surprising to me that this came out of China and that there are going to be more things like that coming out of that country. So given that that's likely, you know, what's the reaction on our side on in the United States and, and in Western countries when you've got another country that's going to uh, possibly just be going full steam ahead with this? Yeah, I know, Zach. The crazy thing is, is that like we're scared because we're like, oh, my gosh, like the U.S. has always been, you know, the scientific superior, you know, like superpower. And we've always done everything first. Right. Like we've always been behind so much of science. And as we start to lose this, you know, to other countries, to China, because of our regulations, holding people back because of our, you know, religiosity, where we're, we're we think things are so sacred, it's going to prevent us from, you know, being doing all these cutting edge things and everybody else is going to, you know, accomplish them first. So the thing about this experiment is that, you know, as far as 
I can tell you, I, I did a PhD in protein, biochemistry, biophysics. So I can look at the DNA and amino acid sequences of the CCR5 proteins that he engineered. And I can see, you know, tell if it would have a similar effect to the CCR5 Delta 32, which is the naturally occurring, um, you know, HIV resistant gene mutation. And as far as I can tell, even modeling these proteins on a structural level, it looks like that they should all work. So like, it looks like he should be successful. If the data that he presented is true and real, like it looks like he actually, you know, did was successful and that's, you know, mm. crazy. But there's been a lot of uh, pushback from the scientific community saying there's, there are things that don't look like they quite make sense um, and that uh, that we, I mean, obviously we don't know what the long-term effects of this are going to be, but uh, are the criticisms out there of what he's done uh, well-founded from your perspective? Um, and I mean, just on the scientific level, we can get to the ethics in just a second. No, I mean, I think we do understand the long-term effects though. And that's the crazy thing, right? It, this didn't happen in a bubble. And I think the problem is a lot of people are looking at it like that. People are saying this person did this experiment and it was in a bubble, but it wasn't. So not only were experiments done on mice and monkeys and they them tested like behaviorally and everything, but other researchers have used this CRISPR on the same exact place on the same exact gene and found that it didn't have any of these off target effects. Hmm. So it seemed like what he was doing was he was going for some, you know, low hanging fruit, so to speak, some gene that was already really well studied. With and just so I CCR5. can, uh, sorry, just to interject for a second, the off target effects just means basically unintended consequences. And yeah, you're saying yeah. that, as far as you can tell, none show up in the genome at this point. Is that basically your so, read of the situation? So what he, so what they did was they did genome sequencing on the embryo after fertilization after CRISPR. Then they did genome sequencing three times while the embryo was inside the mother, <laughs> and then they did three times. Then they did genome sequencing once it was born on the cord blood another you know threefold genome sequencing and they claim they found no off-target effects obviously you know uh nobody's seen the data for this but if this person is presenting the data we have to take it at you know face value what they present so they looked at all these things extensively probably the most gene sequenced human beings to ever exist were these babies being born Mm -hmm. And they could find nothing, nothing abnormal in them. Hmm. There, so uh, there are obviously a lot of ethical implications here, and uh, s uh, people are asking about it in the comments. Um, well, okay, one person here says, uh, Mike uh, Moskpart says, why would it be wrong to have designer babies? As far as I can tell, it's perfectly moral to want your children to have desirable traits. So we're talking about not just taking out uh, you know, uh, or, or creating a sort of immunity to HIV or, uh, taking out the Parkinson's gene or whatever. I guess we're talking about cosmetic changes, eye color, IQ, height, these sorts of things. What's your take on that debate? So, you know, first we can look at what surveys have shown, right? So a bunch of people have done surveys on genetic modification, embryogenetic modification, and in the, the latest survey, 11% uh, of people, only 11% of people were against gene modification of an embryo to prevent a disease or prevent suffering in some way, right? Only 11% were against. We're talking, you know, not scientists, just a uh, general population, everybody. And then when you talk about enhancement, that number goes up a bit, um, it's more like 30% are against and 30% are, are for and like 40% are uncertain. But my question basically is, is how do you define an enhancement versus a disease, right? So 
if if you say, well, is it can it be considered a disease to be of short stature, right? So if you're like three foot tall, is that considered a disease? Most people would probably say, you know, yeah, like that that's something that we could treat. But hmm. then you say, well, what about 3.6 inches? What about four foot? What about four or six inches? What about five foot, right? There's no clear way to draw a line between disease and enhancement because it's it's all part of the human experience. And so because there's no line to draw, I think instead of focusing on should we do this or shouldn't we do this, we should be figuring out like, how do we make this accessible to people, hmm. right? Right, like we're trying to stop something that we can't stop. We're trying to control something that we can't control. You can't control DNA, right? Like drug sniffing dogs, you, you can have things that smell drugs. Like DNA is everywhere. You can't have dogs that sniff DNA. Hmm. You can send DNA on a piece of paper in an envelope to somebody and they could purify it from that. Like scientists do this all the time, right? So it's like an uncontrollable type of drug. Right. And like, what are you going to do? Stop trying to control it. Instead, let's figure out how to go forward with it properly so everybody gets access to it. Like, that's the big deal to me. Okay, so yeah, this is kind of the broader, like, transhumanist question, which is, uh, if these things are inevitable, as you seem to believe they are, I guess that means we should just step on the gas and, you know, see what happens uh, and all become uh supermen or uh, i mean how do you see this this all playing out you know what i have no idea Obviously, uh, let me I'm sorry let me ask one other question because one thing that does worry me a little bit about it is the prospect of it getting in under the control of governments so if as yeah. a scientist in china has is the first one to do this to a human being we know what the Chinese government is like. And if we are starting, you know, if there's an ability to one day, say, enhance IQ, is the government going to start kind of mandating that IQs be enhanced as a uh, competitive advantage in the global economy? And then are we in a sort of arms race type situation? Uh, I mean, is this just uh, fantastical, crazy speculative stuff or... Um, is this within the realm of reality as, as far as you can tell? Well, the question is, isn't like, are people going to do this? The question is, has it already happened? And the answer to that is, is yes, right? Yeah. If you look at vaccinations, um, it was ruled by, I, I, I think it was the Supreme Court or a court in, in Boston, Massachusetts, that people can be forced to vaccinate themselves if it is in regards to the public good, right? Vaccinations, what they do is your body creates an immune response to these, the things that you inject in. And what that does is that modifies your DNA. That immune response is stored in your DNA. So then for the rest of your life or 10 years or something, your body can react, you know, immunologically to, uh, you know, this disease or whatever is going on. And that is genetic modification, forced genetic modification. Not only that, like you think about how uh, we screen for things like trisomy 21 and other diseases, right? Isn't that kind of like you're, you're trying to remove from your population people who might be less intelligent, right? A lot of the, you know, trisomy 21, things like that cause mental deficits usually. Uh, and we, we in many countries, you know, trying to remove those things from our population. Like where has the line already been passed is mm -hmm. my question. And I think it has, right? We, we are already screening embryos for a number of diseases. When you have children, right? They screen the embryo. You, they, they, they can now purify the fetal blood cells from the mother's blood really easily they don't have to do amniocentesis anymore old school where they had to like stick a needle into the you know uh, amniotic fluid no they can just take draw mother's blood and test the baby screen the baby right before it's even born n know what's going on like mm -hmm. this stuff is it, it's already there it's already happening and to me it's like people 
just they they want to close their eyes to it. They don't want to recognize. They don't want to believe it's going on. And instead, they're worried about this bo potential boogeyman that we already have that already exists, mm. right? And so it's something more that we have to embrace. It's something more that we have to look at, you know, modern medicine as something that can be beneficial to so many people. And I'm not saying necessarily that like we should genetically modify babies or something like that, but there are so many ways, you know, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where, you know, you can do IVF and you could screen, you could take a few cells out of the fertilized embryo and screen those, right? Imagine if, Everybody had embryos that, you know, 10 embryos. When, when you went to get pregnant, they said, right, here, pay $10,000. What we'll do is we'll take 10 embryos, sequence them. We'll tell you the eye color, the approximate height, what diseases they might be susceptible to. And you get to choose one of those 10 embryos. Like, you get to choose a healthy child. Like, I don't know what parent wouldn't choose a healthy child. Hmm. Right. Yeah. No parent wants to see their child suffer. But then, as you said, uh, it's difficult, maybe impossible to delineate between what is a health issue and what is elective, you might say. Um, and that will be an ever evolving question as the technology advances and people can more easily make these tweaks. Does it make sense to draw a line and say, you know, um, I mean, first of all, how do you even get there with humans, given the ethical implications? This is a these these babies, these embryos that you're experimenting on are going to become a human being. So how do you ethically say, well, yes, it's OK to uh, experiment with modifying their genome using CRISPR? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question, and it's a it is a strange question in a couple ways because I and I don't it's hard to wrap your head around for a number of reasons. The first is that like experimenting on an embryo is experimenting on a human, but having an abortion, most people you know don't consider that a human, which is strange to me, you know, because it's like wait, can you can you can you hold both of those ideas in your mind at the same time and it still makes sense? Maybe right because technically killing something before it comes out instead of like, you know, something that will come out. Uh, the other thing is like embryos and children have no, they have no rights, right? As a parent, you choose whether to vaccinate your children. You choose when to vaccinate your children. You choose everything for your child, right? You choose whether your child is, uh, you know, what school they go to, what food they eat, um, you know, so many different things. And it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like children don't get a choice in anything. So why is that all of a sudden a big deal? Why, you know, I read something on Duke University website about this, and they were talking about, um, you know, the embryo doesn't consent. And that kind of, I don't... <laughs> made me chuckle a little bit because I'm just like, wait, when do we ever ask embryos or children for consent for anything? Like, when? Is yeah. this like a, I don't know. Well, uh, w there's a couple questions coming in here. Then one of them is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it's uh, someone asks, uh, Misra Ahmed asks, what are the IP implications of CRISPR? Um, if you, if I use your kit to create a new strain of yeast and attempt to patent it, would Odin or Jennifer uh, Dudna, who just one of the discoverers of CRISPR, have a competing claim? So yeah, I, I mean, it there are already major uh, IP uh, battles going on over CRISPR. Uh, could you give us the lay of the land there and and kind of what your thoughts are on, you know, being able to patent? Uh, something like CRISPR? Uh, my company, we don't patent things. We don't try to take away people's rights or anything like that. The patent landscape for CRISPR, so basically CRISPR existed. It was discovered. It wasn't created. Um, and then it was patented for use 
right? So this is a really interesting thing that happens with biologicals. And that is that biologicals that are discovered can't be patented, but their use can be patented, right? So you can patent the use of CRISPR in humans or patent the use of CRISPR in, in, in certain organisms. So if you use CRISPR in an organism to modify it and then sell that organism on the market, you'd probably be breaking you know, the IP patent rights. Whether they wanted to enforce that or not is unknown. Um, and there, hasn't seem, there doesn't seem to be much enforcement going on right now with these patents. There does seem to be a lot of licensing going on, though. Um, the patent landscape for CRISPR is insane. There are thousands of patents uh, you know, that have been filed and like multiple people own different parts of the technologies. So it's just crazy. Nobody really knows how it's going to pan out. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, go to a country that doesn't enforce U.S. patents and <laughs> make your organism or do your human experiment. Like China, perhaps? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some other country. Um, someone else asks, Dar uh, um, dark side to hanged clown asks, does CRISPR work on plants? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. So CRISPR works on most every organism, not quite every organism, but it generally, so what CRISPR actually does, how it works is there's this protein called Cas9 that was found in bacteria. And what this protein does is it cuts your DNA. That's it. It just cuts your DNA. When it cuts your DNA, your cells initiate a repair process to repair this DNA. Now, that repair process is present in many, many different organisms. Um, most every organism, especially mammals and on up. Um, so when this repair process happens, that's when you can genetically modify DNA or the cells because you can trick the cell into inserting something into the genome. Um, so you can imagine it's, it's yeah, it's pretty adaptable across these. And uh, someone else here has a, a kind of a clear, more clearly formulated question of what I was trying to get at earlier, which is, uh, this is from Radical Bear question. Um, it's clear humans will be doing CRISPR on babies unless government cracks down. And as you've already mentioned, it's going to be difficult to crack down eventually. Um, how do we minimize the negative effects? Randomize control trials? Oh, geez. Randomized control trials. Uh, um, here's the problem is really interesting and why I think the FDA is eventually going to be on its way out. So the FDA is decent at what it does, right? So their goal is to allow people to make medicines that hurt the least amount of people, help the most amount of people, and get companies money. Right. Because if companies aren't making money off of the drug discovery process, then they're not going to keep making drugs. It doesn't make any sense. So what happens is you get these drugs that are trying to treat, a, you know, a large group of people. It's not looking for individual outcomes. Right. Which is a completely different thing. Individual outcomes can't be clinical trialed. And a lot of medicine like gene editing, like immunotherapy is precision. It's based on your genome, it's based on who you are, right? So the clinical trial model doesn't necessarily work for this type of thing, hmm. right? It's So this is why it's, it's you're one that, reason you're a, an advocate of self-experimentation? <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily an yeah. advocate of self-experimentation. I'm an advocate of self-experimentation because haven't found out a better way to work around these mm. FDA guidelines legally, yeah. right? That's the big part is legally is like, I could go and I could pirate Lux Turna, which is the gene therapy that was, you know, just approved last year, um, at the end of last year, which cures this inherited form of blindness. I could pirate that and make that for a few thousand dollars and provide it to people. Mm. Obviously I'm going to go to jail for it. Right. And, uh, I'm not going to inject anybody in their eyeball either. Like I'm not down for that. Yeah. <laughs> but like, it, it begs this question, like how do we get these individual outcomes to people, mm. right? How do we get drugs to people inexpensively? How do we make a system that can help people except it's 
it doesn't require people to invest hundreds of millions of dollars. It doesn't require five or 10 years. It incentivizes getting people healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know yet, but it's definitely not the FDA. Is there a model of, I mean, with the self-experimentation, I mean, is there any precedent of that working out well, uh, like leading to some sort of breakthrough? Or is it always kind of a scientist just slowly uh, killing himself by uh, injecting himself (laughs) with toxins? Yeah, no, I mean, self-experimentation has been a, you know, has a storied history in science, even as recently as, you know, the late 90s and 2000s when Barry Marshall drank Helobacter pylori to convince people that ulcers were caused by bacteria and not just stomach acid. So he drank it to give himself ulcers and then took antibiotics to cure it, which was, you know, crazy. And he won a Nobel Prize for it. Um I'm not saying anything I do is Nobel Prize worthy, probably, you know, not for sure. But I think getting around all the regulations that sometimes are put in place to prevent people from bringing people treatments is uh, a positive thing, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People always look at biohackers like uh, or people like me, like uh, we're dumb and we're hateful or we're doing things bad. And it all comes from the heart. It all comes from like, look, I know people who are dying from these diseases. I know people who are suffering. Like all I'm trying to do is get these people help. Right? Yeah. And if you can see that, if the FDA can see that, if the government can see that, that like all we're trying to do is get people help, maybe we can uh, find a way forward. Yeah, I mean, this is really a, I guess, systemic critique uh, that, that's implicit in your project, which is like, we need a we you know these institutions are important but we also need a decentralized science because that's a different way for discoveries to be made and just to kind of buttress your point about uh the fda and some of the obstacles they throw up i want to play one more clip here and then we'll uh close out with a few more audience questions um and this is uh from a time that the fda uh kind of, uh, you you had to get on the phone with the FDA. So uh, let's take a look at that. A kit allowing anyone to make yeast fluorescent by inserting a gene from a jellyfish. If the CRISPR kit is akin to an open-ended programming tool for advanced users, the yeast kit is more like a ready-to-use program you download from the App Store. Consumers don't necessarily want to build something from scratch. The majority of people just want to use it. I just want to be able to use this to you know, make a new organism. Several breweries began to put the yeast app to use right away, brewing fluorescent beer. One even offered to partner with them to create a special blend. When a local reporter began writing up a story about the partnership, word reached the Food and Drug Administration, which gave Zayner a call and informed him he was selling an unapproved food additive. Just for your background information, anything that imparts color to food is considered a color additive. And under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, color additives need to have pre-market approval by FDA. They can't technically regulate our kits because our kits aren't food. They can only really regulate the way we market our kits. We can tell people, you can get these kits and use them to engineer yeast. And wouldn't it be cool if someday you could use engineer yeast to brew, right? Like, hypothetically. In another... Okay, uh, so it's kind of amusing to me that uh, you genetically modified this yeast to make it glow, and then the FDA is like, well, technically that's a color additive. Like, that's their uh, concern about the, this. Uh, but how did that all work out, first of all? Uh, so what we did, it was interesting because, um, you know, to submit these things to the FDA and get an approval is... Uh, you know, pretty ridiculous. I mean, the the experiments that people do or or submit to the FDA sometimes are just a joke. It's like we ran it through this database to see if there were it matched any known toxins. We ran it through this database to see if it matched any known allergens um, and stuff like that. We did the same thing, but 
that wasn't necessarily a concern because this molecule, GFP, you can literally find videos and clips online of like whole animals that express in every cell of their body mm -hmm. and they function just fine. Like this molecule has been around in science for, you know, years and years and years, decades, and, and it's been used in whole animals. Whole animals have this molecule in it. Um, and so it was kind of like a funny it was a joke it was like one of the most ridiculous things because they were basically saying like 20 years of research that's been done by scientists in animal testing that's been done by scientists doesn't matter um you have to submit your own you know approval pre-market approval to get this done <laughs> we just you know we kept selling them and we kept marketing them as for brewing and baking and things like that and they didn't come after us and they haven't come after us. And I think that's because the FDA selectively regulates like a lot of government, right? Mm. They're like, what are the chances of this actually hurting somebody? And do we have anybody who, who could possibly testify against this person? Mm -hmm. And no, like this thing, it, you know, I've drank a lot of the glowing beer. I drank it with T-Pain, you know, uh, <laughs> in October um made some with tea pain and we drank so like a bunch of people have drank this it's it's totally good uh i don't know what people are worried about yeah and, and it just struck me that i mean you said earlier you know your mission here is to get this in the hands of as many people as possible and um eventually because the, and and it kind of strikes me a little bit uh there's a parallel between you and someone like uh the Cody Wilson at Defense Distributed, who uh, pioneered the 3D gun. And there's a reality of like firearms exist. So might as well get them to the people. Uh, and uh, good luck government trying to stop it. And it seems like your attitude here is kind of like genetic engineering is here. It's, it's a reality. And who do we want to be in control of that power? Is that about right? Exactly. No, that's the thing. It's like, not only is my company, you know, trying to educate people and stuff like that, but what it's trying to do is if regulation actually happens, right? Like if you look at guns in the US, and there's more guns than people who live in the US, like a buyback is not going to work. You can't go door to door either. Like it would just not only cost too much time and money, but like people would get, it would be crazy. There would be an all out war. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine the same thing happening with genetic engineering. If the government comes and says this stuff is regulated, I hope it's at a place where so many people have this technology in their homes that it's just unfeasible. Yeah. It's just like, well, good luck trying to regulate it because everybody already has a genetic engineering lab in their home. Like, what are you going to do? Like, it's so hard to track and trace and be, you know, there's, there's no, you know, with firearms, they have all these things. It's just like, it's too late. And I think you should stop thinking about how do we control this? The government should stop thinking about how do we control this? And instead they should be thinking about how do we use this technology to help the most amount of people? Like mm -hmm. bioethicists, invest your time in that. There's so many people dying right now and suffering right now. Those are the people that you should be, scared for the people who aren't getting help now don't be scared for the people who are going to inject themselves with some dna and you know might get a sore arm for a day like those people are going to be fine yeah be scared for the terminally ill people who are dying right now yeah the and um the one of the kind of positives to come out of the trump administration is passing this federal right to try law which allows people to easier access to experimental uh, treatments, people who are terminally ill. And so this is kind of taking right to try a, a step further, uh, which uh, is, is interesting. Um, but I, we're coming to the end here and I wanna just get through some of the questions because people have been asking some good questions. So we'll do a kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, fast, let's see, uh, radical bear question, uh, radical bear. Uh, he asked that great question before. Uh, how does biohacking move from amateur world to a world like we have with computers where an average person is programming? Are costs of a full lab a big bottleneck? No, cost of a bit. Like we sell labs for our company for under $2,000.
So that's not necessarily the bottleneck. And you could get it, you know, way cheaper if you scavenged eBay and got parts and stuff yourself. Uh, it's not the bottleneck. I think the bottleneck is just education, community, uh, resources, right? Like tutorials and things like that. I think it just needs the people to contribute. And the problem is a lot of people who have normally had this knowledge, PhD scientists and academics, they think it's the worst thing in the world to tell people how to do this stuff. So there's very few people who had the knowledge a priori who are willing to provide the knowledge now. So it's just building up that, you know, base level of knowledge that people can just go to and be like, I want a tutorial on how to edit a rabbit using CRISPR. There's a step-by-step -step guide exactly where you order stuff from and exactly how you do it. And there isn't that right now. Uh, and there, here's another one. Um, ah, I just lost it. Uh... Okay, uh, holo amasim. I'm I'm sorry. I am pro this, but do you think there needs to be some regulations in regards to human slavery, child abuse, etc.? Some people might make beings just to be abused. There needs to be some regulation. Uh, well, that that seems wow, a little bit besides the point. Yeah, that's kind of like we already ban slavery, but I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. So like, here's the thing: is like you look at cars, right? Hmm. And uh, people start driving in cars and people got in car accidents and they're like, oh, shit, you know what we should do? We should put in some stop signs and some guardrails and stop lights. And I know there's probably some, you know, super libertarians out there who are like, stop signs are just a government way to control us. But, you know, like stop signs and guardrails are kind of good, right? Like It depends if it's a uh, on a privatized road or not, uh, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, a Just guardrail, kidding. like, nobody, it's hard to, like, find a, re, a thing wrong with a guardrail. And you can imagine that, like, we can put guardrails in place for some of these technologies. I don't exactly know how yet, um, but I think it's definitely possible to put in these guardrails, mm -hmm. to put in these stoplights that don't infringe necessarily on people's rights. They just make it safer for everybody so people aren't like accidentally crashing into each other hmm. well maybe what this person is getting at is is there some way that for instance a military could kind of engineer a super soldier you know somebody that has no fear uh and no, or, you know, I, I don't know how much of this can is that nobody really knows how much of this is genetically determined, but um, just kind of really turning up the attributes that make somebody a good soldier. And then this person almost becomes a, a proprietary creation of the government um, are I, that might be along the lines of what this person is worrying about is scenarios where governments or corporations or other organizations are kind of like tweaking things for their own their own gain oh i'm sure i'm sure people the thing is, is like you can already create all other animals that are super ripped and jacked right i mean i could tell you the mutations right now that you need to make or even the gene therapies you need to give yourself self stuff i mean epo is already used by people it's uh put in their body you could do epo gene therapy to increase your endurance right you could do folostatin to increase your musculature they've done this in every animal folostatin um you could do a lot of different modifications to where you'd be a, a very good athlete have lots of endurance and i'm sure you could find some way to inhibit fear or, or knock out things like that uh, it's not unreasonable to think this stuff can happen uh, how do we stop it from happening? I don't know. Like, I don't... The thing is, I, I think the problem with technology is we always try to apply the, the, the world of right now and the thinking of now to what is, it's going to be like in the future. And we have no idea what the regulatory structure is going to be, what the in, you know commercial nature of this stuff what the industrial nature of this stuff is going to be like how it's going to be perceived by society in the future um uh, it might be something that people don't mind it might be something that people hate you know who knows and uh so let's wrap up with just your prognostications for the next five to ten years uh what do you think is like what are we in store for 
you know, I thought if you were to ask me before this guy genetically engineered embryos, uh, when genetically modified embryos was going to happen, I probably would have said five or 10 years from now. And it happened, you know, this year, if you would have asked me, when's the, you know, time somebody's going to try to genetically modify themselves experimentally after I tried, I would have said another year or two. And it happened right after, like within two months or something. I think this stuff is moving so fast and it's, it's really exciting. Um, and I think that's just going to lead to a lot of positive benefits for us. I think the big thing we're going to probably see is if the U S does ban this stuff, there are a lot of places in, within close proximity, like St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Haiti, Dominican Republic hmm. that don't have an FDA that don't have any form of medical regulation. And, uh, it wouldn't be hard for somebody to go set up there and have people fly over and do this type of stuff, help people, um, and maybe also modify them so they have enhancements. Okay. Well, uh, if you want to know more about this stuff, go to the uh, uh, hyphen Odin dot com. That's uh, Josiah's website. You can get yourself a CRISPR kit and learn to do this yourself. I'll put up a shot of a uh, their tree frog kit, which uh, allows you to, I guess, w you can actually make this little frog glow. <laughs> it doesn't actually make them grow. It's actually, uh, it takes the human gene, IGF-1, and inserts it into it. So IGF-1 is primarily expressed during puberty in humans, and it makes human... Uh, bigger and stronger muscular right so it, it makes the frog bigger it makes them grow big all right well <laughs> we all want a future with a uh, huge tree frogs uh, everywhere so um yeah know, right? uh, uh, uh so yeah um check out josiah at the odin.com uh thank you very much for uh joining us josiah i'm gonna uh, oh this is awesome yeah I, I love all the work you guys do i especially you zach i love all the work you do. It's awesome, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to just talk to uh, the audience a little bit and let you and uh, first of all, thank you everyone who tuned into the live stream. This was a uh, 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 first time for me, uh, like I said, and uh, was uh, there's a learning curve here. So apologies for any technical difficulties, but we will get better. And I hope I personally will get better. And as I mentioned, it's not going to be, if we continue doing this uh, in the new year, it's not going to be only me in the uh, hot seat. So we're, op we're open to suggestions. If, if there are people you'd like us to see, uh, you'd like to see interviewed on here or topics, uh, feel free to, you know, leave those in the comments section or I just put up, um, oh, sorry, that's not, speaking of technical difficulties, uh, let's see, we want the email. Yep. Okay, uh, the email's not up here, but uh, just questions at reason.com. If you email us there, uh, you can ask us, ask questions of our next guest who will be Lenore Skenazy, uh, or you can suggest future guests uh, and just let us know, you know, if you do like this idea and if it's worth continuing or not. Um, I think the, the forum is interesting just because it allows a kind of free or flowing conversation. Uh, people threw in uh, interesting questions that took us in to new places that uh, I wouldn't have taken us. So uh, I think it's a, it's a fun thing to try. So um, tomorrow we'll be back here, same time, uh, 7 uh, p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, talking to Lenore Skenazy, who... Uh, is known as, uh, as a one time known as America's worst mom for letting her uh, seven year old ride home by himself on the New York subway. Uh, and then she started the Free Range Parents Project and she's now partnered with a uh, social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt, and started something called Let Grow, which is all about uh, raising free and independent children in uh, society that uh, encourages the opposite, I would say. Uh, so that should be interesting. Uh, and then just a preview on uh, Wednesday, uh, we'll be talking with Rick Doblin, who founded the group MAPS, which is 
the premier psychedelic science research organization. Uh, and that uh, we're going to talk about the latest developments uh, in psychedelic science and also the legalization of psychedelics. Uh, some interesting stuff is bubbling up there. And then Thursday, I'm going to be talking with Christian O'Brien of the YouTube channel 1791L, uh, which is a young conservatarian type political channel. And we're going to be talking about the future of the right uh, with him because uh, he is part of that. And then on Friday, I'm going to bring uh, editor uh, Nick Gillespie, uh, editor, recent editor at large, Nick Gillespie on the stream. And we're going to touch again on a topic we touched before, which is postmodernism. Uh, we made a video together uh, about that and uh, got a lot of interesting reactions. So we want to respond to the reactions. So you can actually start now emailing me at questions at reason.com, any questions you might have uh, for Nick. And we may or may not have a special guest uh, on that episode as well. So we've got some interesting stuff coming up. Remember to subscribe and press the notifications button uh, to know when we go live. And uh, thank you once again for uh, tuning in. Uh, this was fun. Bye. Mm -hmm.